yes, there's that much to talk about. <laughs> um, oh, she knows how to operate. That's cool. Thank you. Let's pray for a minute, please. Good and gracious Lord, we've been all over the place with this message, you and me. And I ask you, Lord, to be the author of the words that come out of my mouth so that this message is yours. In Christ's holy and precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, thank you, Teresa, very much. Uh, three weeks ago, I had the outline for this sermon. I knew exactly where it was going. I knew where it was beginning. I knew the middle part of it. I knew the end. I knew the scriptures I wanted to use. And then Tuesday, when we got back from our, our trip, I sat down and I spent about four hours typing it up, polishing it, felt really good about it. And then I had Bible study the next morning. And then we had Wednesday night Bible study and then Thursday morning there were some changes, so I rewrote it on Thursday, and then Friday, <laughs> and Saturday. And at 5 a.m. this morning, hopefully this is the last draft, because it's coming out now. And Teresa, thank you so much that I shot her probably a dozen new scriptures this morning and asked if they could be up on the slides. So you are my hero. Um, the topic is pursuing or pursuit of holiness. And holiness has been something that has been weighing on my heart for several years now, but we needed to be doing an in-depth study on holiness. And, um, and it seemed like every time I went looking for a holiness Bible study for the women's Bible study, a lot of women's Bible studies tend to be fluff. There's a lot of fluff in it. They'll, they'll have uh, small groups, and they'll have little activities, maybe even a craft. Um, but I felt like that holiness was such a heavy sub subject, such a weighty subject, that that was really not what we needed to do, was to be playing with holiness. We needed to really dig into it. So I kept shelving it, and then something else had come up, and I'd try again, and, and then I'd get distracted as we do, and of course 2022 was a total distraction the whole year, and then in 2023, we found ourselves breaking away from our home church, and suddenly the pursuit of holiness became a priority. So our summer Bible study um, for the women this year is this little skinny book called Daily Prayer Pursuing Holiness. Um, by Bernice Aguilera, and it is not a Bible study that is meant to have activities. It is scripture and a prayer and then some suggestive reading, and that's it. And the great thing about it is you start there and where God will take you from there. So we have had some really good discussions on Wednesday night, and, uh, and I wanted to share with you the scripture that we had this past Wednesday and that is basing our whole lesson today on. So if you are able, please stand for the reading of his word. <clears throat> Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not conform to the passions of your former ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. This is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16 from the Berean Study Bible. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Please be seated. So my Bible has the um, heading for this particular scripture, A Call to Holiness. A call to holy living. And um, I wanted us to notice the three-pronged attack that uh, approach to this call that this leads us with. First is, prepare your minds for action. Some translations, like the NIV, will say, with minds that are alert. Uh, the Christian, um, the contemporary English version, I think what CEB stands for, is be alert and think straight, but I love New King James. Gird up the loins of your mind. <laughs> we are going into battle. Where is Satan first going to attack us? In our minds. 
He's going to use reasoning to try to get us to question God's truth. Think about what he did with Eve. Did God really say that? Planting doubt just a little bit to make you question God's word, to undermine your dependence on God's word. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11.3, I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And in 1 Peter 5.8, Peter says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Gird up the loins of your mind. We are in battle. The second part is be sober-minded. And the Sunday School class that meets in here actually covered this earlier, so this is a repeat for you. Just stick with me. Um, the Amplified Bible says to be completely sober in spirit, steadfast, self-disciplined, spiritually and morally alert. So I went looking for characteristics of a sober-minded person. And I found um, an interesting take on it under Promise Keepers Canada. It says that it's about having clear thinking. It's about not allowing wrong influences so that we can be clear-headed in our judgments and our behaviors. We shouldn't be so intoxicated by our successes, nor so beat down by our failures, that we allow us to not rest on Christ. Sober-mindedness is calm, unhurried. Boy, I thought about you, Mark. <laughs> um, marked by temperance moderation, and seriousness. It is right thinking, and it is critical for right living. Remember Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. When Mark and I work together on something, I'm the one that's hurry, 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 and Mark is like, now let's wait a minute and think about this. Third, it tells us to set our hope fully on Christ. Keep your focus on Christ. It's all too easy to get caught up in the daily grind, to get distracted by all the things that we have to get done, to get distracted or pulled down by the stuff we see on the news and what's going on. But we can't let, us, let, uh, let all of that stuff pull us away from what our purpose is to be. In Matthew 22, 37, Jesus gives us our purpose. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's it. That's what we're supposed to be doing, first and foremost. Keep your focus there. In Hebrews 12, Paul reminds us, Therefore, since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, Let's get rid of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let's run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking only at Jesus. Our Paul, in his message last week, reminded us that when Peter stepped out of the boat, and he was the only one who actually asked, can I, can I come? Call me, Jesus. Pretty brave of Peter. Anyway, when he stepped out of the boat, what happened? He took his eyes off Jesus. He noticed the wind and the waves, like we notice the shootings, the bad mouthing, the terrible things that are happening in our world. If we let that stuff drag us down, we are losing our focus. We have got to stay focused on Christ. When we look only at Jesus, focus on Jesus, set all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind on Jesus, then we are preparing for holy living. Now, the thought of us being holy kind of scares us a little bit, makes some of us scoff. Oh, I'm not holy. Only God is holy. Well, that's true. But remember, it is God who is calling us to be holy because he is holy. And that passage in 1 Peter that we had before comes from Old Testament scripture, where God is speaking to all the people. In Le Leviticus 19, 1 to 2, the Lord told Moses to say to the community of Israel, I am the Lord your God. I am holy. You must be holy too. 
in Leviticus 27, 8. So set yourselves apart to be holy, for I am the Lord your God. Keep all my decrees by putting them into practice. Now just read about them. For I am the Lord who makes you holy. He is the Lord who makes us holy. How does he make us holy? Well, first, through the sacrifice that his son Jesus was willing to make for us. Jesus made the way through his sacrifice and resurrection for us to be forgiven of our sins and reconciled to God. Through this free and undeserved gift. Now, how do we accept this gift? By seeking to set ourselves apart. By putting God's decrees into practice by surrendering to God all that we are. Romans 12.1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Paul tells us to offer our bodies, our whole selves, as living sacrifice to God, holy and pleasing. But what is pleasing to God? Our reverence, our worship, our submission to his will. God has plans for us. He plans to make us whole, W-H-O-L-E, as well as holy, H-O-L-Y, by his love. In Ephesians 1-4, even before the world was made, God chose us for himself because of his love. He planned that we should be holy and without blame, as he sees us. As he sees us. God sees us through the filter of Christ's sacrifice. Think about that. You don't have to stand on your own. Christ has done it for you. So what is holiness? Is it austere? Is it spiritually elite? Is it, oh, where you deny everything, no dancing, no music, no fishing, <laughs> no sugar? <laughs> Is it living an entirely spiritual life, praying all the time and being a really good person? Well, none of these things are bad in and of themselves. In fact, they're all really good. But if we try to reduce holiness down to a checklist of things to do, got up this morning, I brushed my teeth, I did my Bible study, I said my prayer, now I'll take a shower and get ready for the world. If you reduce it to a checklist, it cheapens holiness. It makes it attainable by human means, and it's not. We can't make ourselves holy. Only God can make us holy. Holiness is an internal condition of the heart. Once we've been spiritually rebirthed in Christ by the Holy Spirit, we receive the righteousness of Christ. It is then given to us, enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit, to learn to live holy and godly lives. When I started doing this is my second time through this book, and when I started doing it in May, I had, when I got to this particular lesson, I had this from some other reading, and I wanted to share it with you. To be holy. We are called to be holy by cooperating with the Holy Spirit as we seek to obey God's will and as we give of ourselves to the people around us. Daily choices matter. Making decisions every day as best we can to please the Lord in our thoughts, in the words that flow out of our mouths, in the actions we take, in the decisions we make. Being holy doesn't mean being sinless. No, we're still going to mess up. Being holy means sanctified, separated unto God, but also different, distinct, separated from that which is common. Only God is truly different and distinct from all things. Hence, he is holy. Holiness is his very nature, and he chose us that we should be holy with him. It's not instantaneous. It happens little by little. God is making us holy. This permeating process that makes, makes us holy continues throughout our entire Christian life. To be fully saturated with God's holy nature doesn't happen against our will. It happens with our cooperation. 
We have to just surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's go back and look at the first verse. Um, on 1 Peter 1.14, it says, As obedient children, do not conform to the passions of your former ignorance. Don't try to live your life the way you did before you let Jesus in your heart. All it's going to do is trip you up and send you down another path. We have to remember that the Holy Spirit has come to reside in us, and now we have to surrender to his nudges, to his leading, to his instructions. If we slip back to the way we were before, we're heading in the wrong direction. In Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, we're told to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. So why do we have to submit to God? Well, because in Isaiah, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I can't make dirt. I can't create a world out of chaos. If you can, then you get to question God. If you can't, he is still the ultimate authority. And so he is the one that tells us where we are right and where we are wrong. We can't even begin to approach holiness unless we surrender to God's will. We can't even think about approaching God until we have accepted Christ's sacrifice for us. Christ paved the way for us to be able to go to God. He's the bridge between us. And we have no hope of ever being holy in God's sight without the leading of the Holy Spirit. And we are so very, very fortunate that God loves us. I mean, you think about it. Why would he make such an obstreperous group of people and then want to spend time with us? Well, God's ways are different than mine, but he wants us. Us. All our warts, all of it. He wants us. He has provided protection for us in the spiritual realm to protect us from the things that we can't see. Because there's a battle going on right here that we can't see. If you think that Satan's not standing here, surrounded by God's angels, you're not looking hard enough. In 2 Corinthians 1, 21 to 22, now it is God who makes both us and you, this is Paul, um, stand firm in Christ. He has anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. We are anointed, sealed, and guaranteed. We see anointing in the Old Testament. Samuel went to anoint Saul to be the king that the Hebrews wanted. Of course, Saul kind of messed that up and lost his anointing when he decided to do things his way instead of God's way. So then David was anointed. Anointing has been, was witnessed by oil being poured over their head. It was a symbol to show that the chosen one is the important, is the chosen one of God and is important to God's kingdom. Anointing has been described as the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. It enables the believer to understand, apply, and administer spiritual truth. Simply put, Anointing enables believers to have a spiritual connection with God and gives them the ability to discern truth. 1 John 2, 26-27 I've written these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. False teachers, they're everywhere. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But just as his His true and genuine anointing teaches you about all things, so remain in him as you have been taught. This does not mean that we know it all, that we can go home and shut our Bibles and not worry about it. God 
continues to reveal his truth to us as we continue to dig in the Bible, as we continue to worship together, as we continue to question. This is telling us that we need to stay with people who are godly and seeking God's will and not to listen to the ones that are going, you don't have to worry about that part. Anointing teaches you about truth, God's truth, the whole truth. The anointing of the Holy Spirit will not work in an atmosphere of lies. If you start believing the lies, what's going to happen to your anointing? You must be obedient. You must submit to believing in the Holy Spirit, to God's holy will. And there's a cost to your anointing. Your anointing is not free. Salvation is free. That's a free gift, undeserved. But your anointing to be used by God for his kingdom, that's going to cost you something. Abraham received his anointing and had to give up his home, his comforts. He was a rich guy. And wander off into the world wherever God led him, not knowing where that might be. The apostles received their anointing when they, when they followed Christ. They gave up their families, their jobs, their way of life. Following God is costly. Jesus reminds us to count the cost. It may cost you friends. It may cost you family. It may cost you your church. You need to have such a deep and personal relationship with Jesus that all other relationships pale. Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. We're going to move on to the ceiling. Having heard and believed the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the pledge of our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. A seal is a mark that is put on the outside of a letter so that you know who it's from or attached to a document to assure its authenticity. In the ancient world, cattle, and sometimes even slaves, were branded with a seal so that you knew who they belonged to. In Ezekiel chapter 9, God sets his seal on, chosen, on his chosen people to set them apart as his possession and to protect them from destruction. In Revelation 7, we read that God has placed a seal on his people to identify them and protect them from the wrath that is to come. A seal communicates ownership, protection, and validation of that very special relationship that God has with his cho chosen children. The Holy Spirit is the Christian seal. God's own spirit comes and takes up residence inside of us. He identifies us as God's inheritance. The Holy Spirit provides the inward assurance that we belong to God that we are his adopted children. To be sealed by the Holy Spirit is a gracious gift from God and demonstrates the authenticity of our relationship with him, as well as, don't forget this part, God's authority over, ownership of, and commitment to his people. He doesn't provide his protection if you're going to go wandering off doing it your own way. Remember Saul. He was anointed, and he lost it. He was sealed, and he broke the seal. You've got to follow God. Ephesians 4.30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? By refusing to listen to him. He's there. He's talking to us all the time. Maybe not in words. I don't know about you, but I actually get words. It's sometimes kind of scary. His nudging, his teaching. If we work in cooperation with the Holy Spirit in our lives, we don't break God's seal upon us, and we don't lose our anointing. If we lose our anointing for that particular subject, for that particular thing, that doesn't mean God's going to throw you away. That means you don't get to get the blessing of whatever that was God had before you. That doesn't mean that he won't offer you another opportunity to serve him. But again, you've got to surrender to him. Surrendering to God is the whole thing. Top to bottom. Plus 
else but place. <laughs> when we are working with the Holy Spirit, listening and following, we see holiness begin to take shape in our lives. What the world sees on the outside matches, hopefully, what we really think and really feel. I saw a video on Facebook the other day by a preacher, and I have tried to go back and find it, and I cannot, and I really wish I could. He said that um, the truth is that too many people, church people included, see their relationship with God's holy word as this, that they have authority over the scripture. That if they don't like it, they don't have to follow it. If they don't understand it, they ignore it. And if they can't explain it, then why should they accept it? And he took his Bible, and he put it on the ground, and he st stood on it. And I thought, oh, standing on the promises. Mm -hmm. Now, this is most people's attitude towards the Bible. I don't like that part. I'm not going to follow that. Part. I think God might have made a mistake here. Did he really mean? What we have to accept is this is God's word. The parts we like, the parts we don't like, the parts we can't explain. I'm with Job. What are you thinking, Lord? But where did Job go with his complaints and his worries? To God. And what did God do for him after his many, many, many chapters? Did he answer all his questions? Did he tell him what he wanted to know? He said, who are you to question me? Did you make the Leviathan? God brought him his presence. God brought him grace and mercy. But he didn't answer his questions. There are things in here we will never understand. There are things in here that people who do not follow Jesus will use to ask us and say, explain that, it makes no sense. Our response should simply be, I don't have to understand it. I know the author. I know God. I trust in Jesus, the one who stepped off his throne in heaven, came down to earth, took on the cross, died and rose again so that I could live with him forever. A lot of people say they want to serve God, but they only want to serve him as advisors. We need to serve God truly, faithfully, and wholly. We have been chosen. We have been anointed. We have been sealed. We have been guaranteed. We need to seek to serve God by submitting to whatever he is calling us to do. Sometimes it's easy. A lot of times it's hard. But God is there with us every step of the way, protecting us under his seal. Your anointing can be used to further God's kingdom, to grow his kingdom, to be a soldier for him, as long as you continue to follow him. Let's pray. Oh God, it would be just heavenly to be able to know how to please you perfectly, and to be all that you have called me to be. But you know who I am. And you know that I will fall. Oh, Lord, that I could be holy as you are holy. Teach me to submit to your will, to delight in your word, and to follow your laws. To truly believe that everything you do really is for my own good. Bless me with a faith like Abraham's that didn't hesitate to follow your call. Protect me from the misunderstanding of Saul when he thought he could do it his way better. Help me to see beyond trials that, they, that I am facing, to see your glory, and to be faithful to you through all. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.